afternoon tea, but I'd like to actually get started. Um, this is our last and very special session for the conference, and it's concurrent session 18, and you are in room 1040. So I hope you're all meant to be here. We have three presenters this afternoon, and I'll introduce each presenter as we go. The first up will be um, Catherine Snedeker, and she is the Concussion Pink advocate and quite a force in the US for pink concussions or women's concussions. And uh, we're going to hold all questions until the end, and at the end I'll invite you to actually come down to the front and ask presenters questions in person so that it can be more personal. So without any further delay, we will start with Catherine Snedeker's present presentation. First, a little background about me. I live in Norwalk, Connecticut. Norwalk's about 50 miles above New York City. I was a social worker before my children were born. Three very active boys, and then had the privilege to become a youth sports coach. I loved being a coach and took it very seriously. From the rules of the game to sportsmanship, it wasn't till my son got a concussion in 2008 that I actually started to learn what a concussion was. I knew about first aid and dehydration. I didn't know anything about concussion. The ironic thing is that my son didn't get injured in youth sports. My son got injured in school at recess. I didn't understand at the time how to care for him. And he sort of ran around for two weeks and then his symptoms got worse and worse. He hadn't been re-injured, but the severity of the symptoms just kept expanding. It was very frustrating, and I saw him miss most of sixth grade and then seventh grade. I had gone to my own pediatrician. I had gone to a concussion specialist looking for answers, and the doctors didn't seem to have answers for me on why this pattern kept continuing and really what a concussion was. At that point, I decided to go to concussion conferences myself that were for doctors and nurses to learn about concussion. Literally, those same years, the CDC published their Heads Up concussion program, which included clipboards, posters, stickers. So I started a concussion advocacy program where I would go out to sports teams, provide concussion education, and then provide them with the CDC materials. What I was noticing, speaking to many parents, is there seemed to be a difference about girls and boys. This four-year period, I spoke to hundreds of families whose children had experienced concussion. I worked with doctors and schools to try to increase education and communication between all the parties. I started to work as a social worker in two different concussion clinics. Throughout this period, I started to see a pattern where the parents of boys seemed to get care for boys faster and their boys seemed to recover faster. I noticed a pattern where the girls' parents would call weeks after the incident the girls would have pushed through symptoms, and the parents seemed less educated about concussion. This concerned me, and I started to really look into the matter and look into research around why this was happening. I'd like to take a moment to talk about sex versus gender. Scientifically, sex may be defined as a biological differences between male and female, including genetic, hormonal, or physiological differences. The definition of gender for purpose of this presentation is thought of as a social construct based upon interpersonal roles, personal identification, and is often but not always concordant with biological sex. Now I'd like to talk to you about launching pink concussions. As I sorted through the research on males, I found this position paper in 2012 where the data suggested that in sports with similar rules, female athletes sustain more concussions than their male counterparts. In addition, female athletes experienced or reported a higher number and a higher severity of symptoms, as well as a longer duration of recovery. The paper went on to suggest that this might be due to head and neck strength, hormones, differential cerebral blood flow, and concluded that further study was necessary. Let's take a second to look at this closer. In sports with similar rules, where the level of risk is the same, female athletes sustain more concussions than their male counterparts. 
Why? Would it be sex differences or gender differences? Having created the SportsCap website with information for youth sports parents, it was natural for me to create a website that focused on female concussions. In 2013, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. It put a halt to my working in schools and with youth sports teams. But I have to say there were lessons that I learned from this year. One lesson can be summed up in a slide that I call sympathy measured in casseroles. Here's a slide I created for the Institute of Medicine presentation I was giving on youth sports concussion in February of 2013. Within the last few years, I had experienced divorce, in which someone brought me a casserole. Hurricane Sandy had damaged our house. We were out for eight months. In that first week, five different meals were delivered to us by the fire department. And in breast cancer, so far in about two and a half months, I had received almost nightly meals. So much food was being brought to the house, and yet I was still going to the gym. I didn't look like I had cancer. I had not lost my hair yet from chemo, yet the support from the community was great. It also ha caused me to look back at the concussions. My son at this point had been out almost a year and a half of school. I had suffered several concussions and no one in the community had ever done anything. No one had even brought us a casserole. And I realized there's something about the way our community responds to injury, to illness. We are all taught with cancer to support each other. We haven't been taught about concussions. So it became one of my missions in my youth sports education to share that when someone on your team, in your neighborhood, in your family has a concussion, how can you reach out and be helpful and provide food? Now I'd like to share with you the sex and gender differences that I found in brain injury during this period. Concussion or mild TBI has long been viewed through a masculine perspective. There's several reasons for this. One, traumatic brain injury in general occurs about twice as often as males as it does in females. Also, at the time, it was predominantly male doctors and researchers studying male athletes playing male sports. Here's a doctor in 1967 comparing football fields of our nation to being the vast proving ground or laboratory for the study of head and neck trauma in man. Also in the lab, the menstrual cycle of female animals affected the results of TBI research. To deal with this variable, the response was simple. No female lab animals would be used in TBI research. Now I'd like to look a little deeper at the fact that traumatic brain injury in general occurs about twice as often in males as it does in females. If we look at this research from 2010, along the x-axis is age group, and then injury rates along the y-axis. You can see that the greatest difference between male and female brain injury occurs in this period. What is the reason for this? Is it gender or is it sex? Risk taking factors of males play a huge role in this period and that can vary from driving fast to consuming more alcohol to more access to firearms, especially in the United States. Injuries and assaults. Males have more concussion at this time period and report more than females. We also don't know over time as women drink as much as men now, will this change or are women having assaults at this period that they aren't reporting? So it'll be interesting to see the next time these numbers are re released. If you have doubts on the risk taking behavior of males in this period, I do suggest going onto YouTube and typing in jumping into pool from roof and most of the content creators will be male. Pink Concussion's website was growing. The more information I added, the more people seemed to come to the website. While I started with research on sports, I began to look at accident data, information from the military, as well as information from domestic violence. And these sources all came together on the Pink Concussion's website. I continued on speaking about youth sports concussion, as well as brain injury in women. With my cancer treatment concluded, I was allowed to travel and attended 14 conferences in 2014. At these conferences, I was able to speak to researchers who were currently researching concussion. I was able to ask them, why were women excluded from your research? And for those researchers that included women, 
I asked, why aren't you reporting the results by males and females? I wore a horrible pink shirt at every conference and became known as the pink concussions woman. I also became interested in what research existed or didn't exist across the female life cycle. And I want to share with you the one piece of information that I feel was the most valuable that I shared with them. You are not bad, crazy, stupid, or malingering. Sadly, this is the statement that I most often had to share with women that called me. They had been diagnosed with a concussion, and over time, their symptoms had not cleared up. And at that point, they were questioned by their family, their friends, their doctors. So let's look back at our woman who is recovering, and her recovery takes more than a few weeks. Her family, her school, her employer, her friends, they may question if she's malingering. This doesn't happen with cancer. No one ever suggested that I was taking too long to recover from my cancer or faking. Now I'd like to share with you some of the current findings in brain injury research that looks at sex and gender. 10 years later, the research still shows that women sustain more concussions in sports with similar rules than their male counterparts, report a higher number and more severe symptoms than male. Current research supports sex and gender differences. Women are seen as a certain population that are greater risk of developing PCS. Women have also been shown to have a worse prognosis after concussion, longer time to resolve symptoms, more PCS following a motor vehicle accident, and more likely to develop PCS after a single concussion event. Women also face more barriers. Women with a TBI are more likely to experience social, financial, and structural barriers needed to needed services. They're also more likely to be affected by poverty, social isolation, lack of family support, and lack of transportation and community resources. Women with disabilities are significantly more likely to be victims of abuse and violence, and women, regardless of a disability status, are more likely to be victims of IPV, which almost always leads to potential TBI and often multiple and repeat injuries. Specific guidelines, screening, but also treatment or policies are needed for these situations. Women are also likely less to receive or complete vocational rehab. They have significantly lower rates of returning to work after TBI. We also need to see more respect of child rearing and household management to be viable rehabilitation goals for women going through treatment. Women with TBI have significantly higher rates of menstrual and endocrine dysfunction. Fatigue, cognitive functional disabilities also represent strong obstacles to the area of family planning and parenting. Now I'd like to switch to something that I'm very excited to discuss with you today, and it is a photo that's worth a thousand words. I remember growing up and hearing tobacco being discussed, and they would show a picture of a lung with smoking effect on one side and a healthy lung on the other. Those visual images are really important in education and presenting science to not only professionals, but to the general public. So I've been waiting for the picture to represent the sex differences in brain injury. So this paper came out in 2018, you found sex differences in axonal structural underlie differential outcomes from in vitro traumatic axonal injury. And in this study, they looked at human axons. So they looked at the smallest level cell level in the brain. And you can see here, this is a cross section of the female axons versus the male axons. And this is in humans. And you can see the women have fewer axons and more slender than the males. Here's a diagram of this. And you can see the female on the left and the male on the right. And you can see when a traumatic brain injury occurs and the nanotubulars at this cellular level slide across each other as the brain turns and twists, there's more damage on the female side than on the male side. And with that loss of function, there is also a trauma that occurs at a chemical level where it's more of a toxic soup for the female cells. Female rat and human axons are smaller with fewer microtubules than the males. And the mathematical modeling shows this microtubular number does affect the outcome from trauma. Female axons have greater calcium influx, the soup I mentioned, after in vitro traumatic injury than males. And in summary, 
Here is some bullet points written by Dr. Doug Smith, one of the authors on the paper. And the final bullet point is, given the same type of head impact, female axons have much more microtubular breakage and a greater influx of ions than the male axons. The pathological soup this creates pushes the female axons towards degeneration and dysfunction rather than recovery. This was the picture that I had been looking for, the scan, the image that would show it just wasn't in women's minds. They just weren't more emotional. They just weren't more forthright. There really was a sex difference, and it could be seen now and hopefully put an end to the discussion that this might all just be in our heads. In 2015, Pink Concussion evolved from a website to a 501c3. Pink Concussion's mission expanded to include educating doctors and researchers, conducting our own research, and empowering and supporting women with brain injury. With a fantastic board and strong leadership, and a professional advisory board of over 80 international experts and the Pink YouTube channel, I came upon the idea of having a show where I interviewed experts. Some of the topics covered in these programs, brain injury in women and endocrine disorders, sleep, rehab, treatment, yoga, meditation, nutrition, and thriving after severe TBI and beyond CT. And the main takeaways, anyone can ask questions in science. It's important that we all take a role in asking the important questions, especially when our group or our family or someone like us isn't included in the research. Second, research needs to include women at all points, study design, data collection results, and show if there are sex differences in concussions. And that expands to women of color, transgender women, women do not equal men in brain injury. It's important to include a gynecologist in the care team to look at some of the hormonal differences and how periods can be affected in brain injury. Be aware of different ways women can be injured that may differ from them, and be aware of gender bias or lack of knowledge of sex differences. Also consider brain donation. Please join us at Pink Brain Pledge. If you're interested in pledging your brain or you're interested in finding out more about sex and gender differences in concussion, please see our website, our Instagram, our YouTube, or our Facebook accounts. And I want to thank you for your attention today, and I appreciate your interest in brain injury in women and girls. Thank you. I'll thank Catherine for us all later. Um, next up we have Dr. Kerry Peake. Please welcome Kerry. Thank you. So thank you for coming, particularly as this is the last session and you're never sure whether anyone's going to stay after afternoon tea. So it's been really inspiring listening to all the presentations over the last two days, particularly the lived experience, because I think it's really important, particularly as I'm a, a researcher now, that we really keep our research um, that is grounded in the people whose lives we are trying to change. Um, so I am a physiotherapist by background, um, but my research really focuses on the prevention space. So I don't do a lot of treatment in concussion, but really to see whether there is anything that we can do um, particularly in sports related head and neck injuries. So I am going to talk to you about some of the background uh, related to neck strengthening. So I will give an outline towards the paper which is now published, um, but I will also talk about what we've done since then because uh, obviously with the conference being uh, postponed a couple of times, things have moved on. So to give you a bit more of a, a background to myself and where I come from, so I graduated as a physiotherapist in the mid-90s um, in the UK, and I was very fortunate when one of my first roles was working with the uh, former England rugby physio, and he was also physio to the British Olympic team, and so he'd developed a private practice which really had specialised in head and neck injuries. We didn't talk a lot about concussion because concussion wasn't really, you know, something that we talked about at that stage, even though when I 
look back, a lot of our uh, clients really were um, had signs of concussion, but a, a lot of them were, you know, transient brachial plexopathies, or they'd had um, neck surgery. And we had a lot of athletes from Formula One um, to winter sports to um, rugby being a, a really big cohort. And I show these pictures because I first presented on this topic in 2003 at the Sports Medicine Australia conference, um, at the APA conference, um, and we also published our first paper, or my first paper was in 2005. And leading up to the 2003 World Cup, which I know was a very long time ago, uh, we actually um, devised neck training programs for most of the uh, forwards in the, in the team, and England famously won against Australia. And I like to think that I had a, a small part to play in that victory as our, uh, you know, our front row had very strong necks. But if I now fast forward 10 years, I've now moved to Australia, I've been a bit distracted, doing other things, getting married, having children, and this is a picture of my son many years ago, he's only eight here, and um, he started playing football, and I hadn't really treated any football players, and I was watching him head the ball and at training and thinking, actually, should these players, should they be doing neck exercises as well? So this really started me on a research journey rather than being a clinician. So, not to overstate what neck strengthening can do, I mean, in, in football, more concussions happen through head-to-head -head contact or head-to-goalpost contact. There's not a lot we can do by having strong necks. This is much more related to rule change and maybe teaching technique. But if we look at uh, rugby, for example, and I'll play this video in a moment, so you, you're going to look at the, the, the guy that receives the ball. There are two aspects where he could develop a concussion. So the first on the tackle, getting a whiplash type motion, and also when he then hits the ground. Because if he hasn't got a strong, stiff, activated neck, when he's tackled, you'll see whiplash type motions, and then when he impacts the ground, he's got to be able to keep that head in the air so that's not also impacting the ground. And that's where neck strengthening can play its role. And so to give you an example of someone with having high head impact magnitude um, and having those high head accelerations um, in that video there, so football is really where I'm very much grounded in terms of my research. And so where football is also different is that you have the act of heading. So uh, football or soccer is probably one of the very few sports where the head is deliberately used as a really integral part of the game. So in the U recent European Championships, one in four goals were scored from a header. So it's really important. And heading is going to be you know, part of this sport for a really long time. So it's important that we look at pragmatic strategies that may reduce the long-term effects of heading while well, heading is part of the game. It may be a time that heading is banned, but we're not there yet. So just thinking about our basic Newtonian physics and what we're trying to do by neck strengthening is increase the effective mass of the player. So this means that the mass of the player that can oppose the force of the ball on impact or the force of a player when they're being tackled. And we're not just talking about strength, we're talking about the ability to activate those muscles really quickly, which I'll, I'll touch on a bit more in a moment. So this is a very low effective mass, so really is that 430, kilogram, uh, 430 gram ball um, hits the player's head, you've only really got four to five kilos um, opposing that. Whereas if we look at, I think, the master of most things um, in football, Cristiano Ronaldo, that watching him head the ball, and as it impacts there, he's got virtually no head movement whatsoever. I mean, that's just a really good technique. And so when I talk to coaches, what we're trying to do when we talk about heading is that a, a high-performing header is also more likely to be a safe header. And I say more likely because we don't really know what's going on in the brain. We're, we're using head impact magnitude or head acceleration as a pseudo measure. And the fact that Ronaldo can do that without um, tearing his ACL on landing is also a bonus. So I won't dwell on the methods, just, just trust that we conducted the systematic review in a very robust way and that we did um, register on Prospero and use a, a Prisma um, guidelines. But going on to the results, we tried to cast our net as wide as possible to look at any studies that had reviewed um, a relationship between neck strength and um, injury risk, as well as those that actually implemented a neck strengthening program. And just looking at the box at the bottom, you'll see that we actually 
actually found very few studies. So it's a, a really an emerging space. And I think this is the one thing that I found, having worked in neck strengthening, you know, in the early 2000s and then coming back 10 years later, that really it hadn't moved on. Um, and that, you know, still talking to lots of different sports and do you do neck exercises in rugby? No, we don't. Um, you know, I was still getting the same answers from, uh, you know, a couple of decades ago. So to go through um, the results, so what we what we did find was that most of the studies were conducted in men um, or boys, um, and a lot of them were conducted in rugby. So we looked at the strength of the evidence based on whether the point estimate um, was below 0.9, but also looking at whether those confidence intervals were below 0.9, and that would determine whether it was certain evidence or uncertain evidence. Um, so in terms of head and neck injuries, there is certainly evidence that incorporating specific neck exercises into an injury prevention program can reduce the incidence of head and neck injuries, but it's uncertain in most cases. So. One of the reasons for that, even though there's quite large sample sizes in these two first studies, is that a lot of these injuries, although they can be quite severe, are still relatively um, lower in incidence compared to other injuries as well. So you do have to have really large sample sizes. Um, concussion, um, a little bit more certain on the evidence, um, but again, just looking at you know a very small number of studies, and the, the bottom study by Morrissey actually included a whole range of different sports, and that was male and female. So in summary, in the studies that we found that compared um, higher neck strength to instance of um, head and neck injuries, including concussion, is that having a you know, higher neck strength can reduce your risk. In those that um, incorporated a neck strengthening exercise program, and most of them were incorporated into a generalised injury reduction program, so it's looking at all that neuromuscular control as well, there is some evidence to suggest um, that it is beneficial. And I, and I kind of think when I do talk to different sports and um, athletes is, you know, why wouldn't you do neck strengthening? You know, it's the only area of the body that we don't routinely exercise. And I think at the moment, really, the greatest risk is that it does nothing. Whereas the benefit could be enormous. And, you know, we know that the risk of a concussion is much greater if you've had a previous concussion. So why wouldn't we do what we can to prevent that first one? So the, th this, this really was one of the studies that we conducted to, to really look at the foundational evidence that already existed in this space to really determine where we were going to go to next. We also completed a systematic review to look at the relationships between um, neck strength and head acceleration in heading, and again, there's evidence to show that, um, that it is beneficial. But what we also found in writing this review that the, the exercises that seemed to be less beneficial in those papers were often isometric exercises or had some sort of endurance base. And when you think back to those those videos of the rugby players, they don't need a strong endurance base. They don't even need to be especially strong. What they've got to be is able to activate incredibly quickly. So there's a fantastic paper by Ian Gilchrist that talks about isometric exercises with ballistic intent. And you'll be hard pushed to find many places that implement exercises that have ballistic intent. So we went on to, um, to take that evidence and to see, okay, so could we devise an exercise that could be incorporated into, in this case was the FIFA 11 plus into part two, that was neuromuscular control, um, that really looked at having sort of a ballistic intent, but included no exercise, uh, no equipment, that was really simple and we could implement it um, during about 90 seconds of exercise um, three times a week. And this is what roughly the exercise looks like. So the aim is to try to, to coordinate and activate that neck muscle to prevent his head from hitting the ground. Um, this, this paper, as I say, is published um, if you want to have a look at the results. But what we actually found was, um, you know, implementing those exercises uh, with a cohort of 12 to 11, uh, 12 to 18 year olds, male and females, is that it did uh, reduce head impact magnitude or head acceleration. Um, and we, we did that using an IMU um, on the back of the paper, uh, on the back of the players' heads when they were doing heading drills. Um, and this was funded by a FIFA research scholarship. We we then 
um, repeated this trial. It, it unfortunately got interrupted by COVID, but we also showed that it had a, a, a reduction in potential concussive events and concussive events as well, and this paper's under review. So in terms of research impact, it, it's not just about publishing papers, and as I say, it's really important that we, we disseminate our research as, as widely as we can to try to affect change. So um, part of that dissemination is making sure during conferences like this, um, talking at various podcasts, getting into the print media, um, so that we're really trying to get into grassroots level. It, it has been very fortunate for me in making some really amazing connections around the world that I'm part of UEFA's heading research group. I'm also part of Football Australia's and we're developing heading guidelines at the moment for Football Australia. Um, I'm also part of the English Premier League's Next Strengthening Expert Group. Um, and so, you know, what's really great is that, you know, there is a potential to really move along what I saw and didn't happen in 10 years that perhaps over the next couple of years we can really change, um, you know, what is considered routine exercises that involves the neck. Um, if you want to follow anything that I'm doing, I, I don't tweet about anything else apart from um, research. You won't see pictures of what I'm eating for dinner um, or even my children. Um, so Twitter's probably the best place to find me or I'm more than happy to answer questions at the end or, or via email. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Although now I feel like what a headache from watching people heading a ball and <laughs> hitting each other on a field. Um, we're ready for our final speaker of the program. Last but not least, uh, Dr. Carlo Renato. So please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. I can't guarantee that if you go to my social pages, you won't see photos of my dog or me eating. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, we're almost there. A few minutes to go and we'll, uh, we're done for the day and done for the program. Um, my talk today is m really more of a, a thought-provoking talk, necessarily not uh, uh, showing in of our research, um, although uh, research will be shown throughout uh, our talk. Um, my talk is about eye movements, uh, in particular dysfunction of eye movements, uh, in, seen in patients um, with uh, MTBI. Thank you to uh, Nick and the, um, and the team at Brain Injury for the invitation. Any opportunity to talk, I'd, I'd jump at it. Um, why am I here? Um, I, I come to you with a experience as a clinician, as a chiropractor, in fact. Uh, over 20 years, um, we see a lot of uh, concussion and related uh, conditions in our office. Uh, I'm a researcher, actively uh, involved predominantly in vestibular research, which is more to do with the, the inner ear and the, ba uh, and the uh, balanced parts of our brain and body. Uh, and also as an educator, uh, actively talking to people on the, this very topic. Just as a disclaimer, obviously, um, uh, for those of you that are potentially um, uh, patients or people that have, or parents uh, of family members, um, that have concussions. Uh, I present this more as a, as a thought-provoking talk rather than um, you know, the hard facts of what you should be doing. Um, I'll present to you things that I see in clinic, uh, where the evidence is, and potentially and hopefully you can have a discussion amongst your, um, your practitioner peers, uh, or if you are practitioners, maybe to consider some of this, uh, these advancements in, in your care for patients with concussion. When we talk about um, eye movements, um, people immediately say to us, oh, but my, eye, my eyesight is fine. Uh, we're not necessarily talking about vision or eyesight as such. We're really looking at the control of your eyes. So just keep that in mind as I go through, uh, go through this talk. 
Eye movements can look like many things. Uh, when we talk about eye movements, we're really talking about um, a number of these uh, subdomains. We can talk about fixation. Uh, fixation is the ability of the eyes to keep stable on an object. And really everything else is, is a subset of that. Uh, we can have vergence, where our eyes are fixated on, a t on, a, on an object as it moves close to our eyes, which is called convergence, or as they move away, called divergence. Um, pursuit or smooth pursuit is where our eyes are following, again, fixating on a target, but this time, this time the target is moving slowly in, uh, from side to side, up or down, or, or in any other direction. A saccade is the fixation of, an ob uh, of our eyes on an object as it jumps quickly from one point to another. Optokinetic is when we're looking at an object in a repeated environment. Um, we have what we call vestibular ocular reflexes where we're looking at an object as we're turning our head and we have these other re uh, movements called uh, VOR suppression where our head, as our head turns, we're following a, an object as our head turns uh, and this object is moving uh, in, uh, with our head. So there's a lot of these eye movements that we we consciously or subconsciously perform on a day-to-day -day basis. And these are very much needed for us to move, to be able to walk upstairs, to be able to follow an object, to be able to drive. There isn't a task uh, with your eyes open that you wouldn't have some degree of fixation or eye movement. So again, keep that in mind. It's been written for some time now, and there's actually a, a book written on this uh, with the same topic Eye movements are the windows of brain function. We often think of, of eye movements as being uh, purely you know, driven by certain muscles that are uh, coordinated by parts of the brain. It goes a lot deeper than that. There's a whole field of psychology that looks at consciousness and behaviours and emotionality, and there are eye movements that are, are linked to that. So eye movements are really a way in which we can peer into the brain and see how the brain is functioning. The neurology behind eye movements is vast and still becoming untangled as we speak. Uh, again, there are many uh, significant textbooks and journals that have been written over many years that talk about um, which areas of the brain relate to certain eye movements. So I mentioned before about sort of the saccades or pursuits or convergence or divergence or vestibular ocular. These are all orchestrated by different areas of the brain. And this has come back, this has come from partly from some um, lesion studies or um, ablation studies that may have occurred in animal models where they may have in a laboratory you know, excised or ablated a certain part of the brain and they've looked at how has that affected the animal's eye movements. We see this with, with humans and those that have suffered from um, traumas like stroke, um, uh, where we can identify which areas of the brain have been affected by the stroke and we can see which eye movements have been affected as a result. There are conditions like Parkinson's, children's neurobehavioural disorders and many other conditions that have very, signi uh, very significant hallmarks of abnormal eye movements that relate to these areas of the brain. And more recently, obviously, with more functional uh, imaging from fMRI or spec scans or otherwise, uh, we can now see, if we get a patient to do certain eye movements, we can see certain parts of the brain light up. Obviously, speaking to a group that knows a bit about concussions and MTBI, we know there are historically typically three types of injuries that, that can occur to the brain, uh, or at least the forces in which the head is, uh, um, uh, can be um, uh, injured. One is more of a linear or a uh, translation type where the head gets hit from front, side, or directly on top. Uh, we have a, rot a rotation-based injury I'll explain that in a moment. And then we have the, um, the impact deceleration. But it's more that rotary type of injury that, um, that I guess I see in practice that correlates with a lot of eye movement disorders. When we have a rotary type of injury, which is almost always the case, even a small degree of head rotation when there's an impact will cause a rotation. Now you've got to imagine we've got a fairly large melon on a relatively small stable um, structure. Um, our spinal cord is tethered 
uh, within our spinal uh, column um, and, our, and our brain is typically well supported within the cranium. But what isn't so supported is that area that where we have a counter rotation between the top part, which is the, the cranium, and the spinal cord or shoulders, which is the, the lower part. And that rotation normally occurs around the brainstem. Now, for those of you who know your anatomy, uh, brainstem is an area that houses a lot of our eye movement centres. A lot of the areas of the brain that control our eye movements, let alone those that control our autonomic centres, our pain perception, our vestibular centres, uh, and many other things that we see as a result of um, traumatic brain injuries. So it's really that rotation that we, we see the, the correlates affect um, our eye movements, let alone obviously direct impact that occurs, occurs on our cortex. The, the evidence now is showing, particularly at least in the, in the sports-related field, that, um, that eye movements are now being part of the standard protocol of, uh, of assessments. Historically, it's, you know, it's the balance test and the neurocognitive test. More recently, we're now starting to look at cervicogenic aspects, autonomic aspects, um, and including the vestibular and ocular motor. So the ocular motor assessment, or at least recognition, is now becoming embedded in our assessments um, of concussions. And there's many, I've just cherry-picked some of the research that supports that. Here in, in military uh, aspects, we see a number of strong correlation between, or the presence of some uh, ocular motor disturbances in patients with um, uh, blast-induced traumatic brain injuries. And these include convergence insufficiency. This is the inability for the eyes to converge, uh, both eyes to converge equally as an object moves close to the nose. Circades and pursuits, as I mentioned, are the slow and the fast eye movements. Ocular asymmetry, so whether one eye sits higher or, or, or lower or in or out relative to the other eye. These are all very common um, uh, findings that we find in practice and in research. Again, more, more evidence to say here that um, uh, these results suggest vulnerability of smooth pursuit and saccade abnormalities in patients with um, traumatic brain injuries and that uh, eye tracking should be part of the protocol to assess. Uh, and again, we have uh, further discrimination of um, aspects of each of these eye movements, from amplitudes to velocities to acceleration. Now with the advent and the use of technology, we can better understand which parts or which eye movements or which aspects of eye movements are related or consistent with people who have had um, traumatic brain injuries. And this is a good paper that, that spoke about, um, uh, again, when, when comparing a group of people without uh, TBI to those with TBI and post-concussion syndrome, they found that um, saccades and smooth pursuits are impaired. Now, you un understand the ability for us to follow or track words on a page, the ability for us to cross a road and to be able to navigate steps and cars or people coming towards us necessitates the ability for our eyes to stay focused on a target. Otherwise, we run the risk that, A, we could fall and injure ourselves. We may lose balance, we may get dizzy symptoms um, or, uh, or, or, or other, um, uh, other concerns as well. This is an example of a patient, uh, a 20 year old patient um, who had post-concussion syndrome. And this is what abnormal eye movements can look like. The, we're using infrared goggles so we can accurately measure and record eye movements. This patient was looking at a large screen and the only thing on the screen was a yellow dot. And that yellow dot was just uh, smoothly moving along that screen and the patient was asked, follow that dot. And there's nothing else for them to see. And hopefully you could see here, if I can repeat that, maybe not, oh, there we go. Look how dysmetric or or um, dysregulated those eye movements are. They should track smoothly from side to side. You can see on many sweeps, on the leftwards and rightwards, you can see those eyes jumping. And this is just one example of, and you can see that quite clearly there. And that's just an example of what we see as a result of um, traumatic brain injuries. 
amongst many other conditions, I should also add. So how do we measure it? A bedside assessment is where you, know, you have the patient in front and we're asking the patient, just track our finger from side to side, look at my finger as I move it from side to side, uh, and we can do it in different directions. So that's a, a bedside low-tech assessment. Like most things, accuracy will also give you, um, um, I believe, better outcomes, and I think, and I'll show you in a moment, a paper that suggests the same, but we can use these more high-tech tools um, these are infrared goggles, so uh, embedded in these goggles are cameras that record eye movements very accurately. The sensitivity of these things are, are ex extremely uh, high uh, and we can document with various graphs exactly what is occurring other than just simply an observation. At least in the sports-related uh, concussion field, um, there's good evidence to say that Unless you have technology, you are likely to miss a lot of the subtleties um, that can occur with eye movements uh, unless you have technology to record it. Uh, and this is the sort of recordings that we can see. Um, this is referred to as a video nystagmography. Um, big word, all it means is basically to record eye movements very accurately using infrared goggles. Another bit of technology that we can use is where we have a computer screen which has a camera embedded. We ask the patient to read a set of text on the screen and as the patient reads, we can detect and record how they're moving their eyes across the screen. Are they cicading or pursuing their eyes accurately as we expect? It's one thing to measure someone's eyes and say, well, look, you're 12 degrees out of out of position or alignment or you're a bit slower here, but the reality is for most people that want to know, can I read, can I do daily activities well? And this is a great test that enables us to, to qualitatively and quantitatively measure eye movements. There are some low tech but validated tools that we can use in practice. Um, there's one that's called the Kindivic test, which is a recorded, which is a time test that someone, um, uh, a patient has to read each of these numbers as they go across the screen, um, and then it's timed. And obviously this becomes, this is an easier set, this is a more challenging where we don't have the lines in between, and then this becomes much more difficult where um, there's a lot of similarities between each of these lines. Someone who has an ocular motor or uh, eye movement dysfunction will struggle to keep reading along a line. All right, so this is a very low tech way to time uh, and record uh, their, their eye movements. Um, the other is the VOMS test, which is the vestibular ocular motor screen test, which uses, a, it's a subjective measure. So it's asking how the people feel when they're doing a series of tests. Most of it is eye-based or head movement-based. Again, standardised, and it's one that's now forming part of a normal battery of tests. If eye movements are found to be part of um, your profile with someone with concussion, then eye movement therapy has is, is, is generally been shown to be quite helpful. And, and there are many professions that use it now. Um, you can use um, you know, cards and you can use um, you, you know, follow my finger from side to side. There are some, um, uh, some technology with an iPad or otherwise that you could use that you could program um, different um, directions or angles or distances between stimulus to help train the essentially train your brain to have better function. And that's what this is. This is not a, an, even that's called eye movement therapy, we're not simply looking at improving the muscles of your eyes. The reality is, is we're trying to improve people's brain function. Virtual reality now is showing, showing some promise to be able to um, provide this, uh, and even in a home-based environment as well. With an augmented reality environment, we can change different um, uh, targets that the patient may see. Obviously, we can make that target quite difficult, like walking through a uh, shopping centre or in a lift or in a car. Um, these are things that we people often say to us, is that, you know, I feel okay in the office, but I don't feel so great when I'm in a shopping centre or I'm walking the street or I'm, I'm a passenger in a car. If we can augment that and train someone's brain to to be more resilient to that and more adaptable, we're, we're hitting more targets. And finally, where some of the um, more recent promises shown is that 
um, we can target these brain networks. So not necessarily eye movements, but we can target the networks of the brain that are involved in controlling eye movements by using different forms of neuromodulation. And they can include uh, low-level laser or photobiomodulation. Uh, can also include uh, transcranial direct current, TMS, and many other things as well. Uh, are starting to come through the research has been an opportunity where we can prime the brain or get the brain ready for therapy. And in clinic, we find that we can, if we do both, we get the we juice up the brain ready for some, for some care and we give our eye movement therapies along with other things that, that we often find with concussion, um, we se seem to get some good results. Um, some of the research that I'm involved with, some of the autonomic capacities and features of concussions and we'll be doing more of this as part of our, our research. But this is, as I said, this is more of a thought provoking talk, one that I share with you as a, as a clinician um, and one that I see and, and hopefully um, it sparks some questions. And, um, and finally, be sure to love your brain. Thank you. Are you asking some questions? Yeah. Yep. I always feel left out that I don't get fancy pictures as part of my presentation. Uh, I encourage you all actually to come further down the front um, and uh, are there any questions people would like to ask? Uh, if you'd like to come down and we'll ask them in a more um, personal uh, environment. So please come down the front and uh, we'll spend some time talking. Thanks.